So in my previous video, I told you about the general architecture of the query optimizer. Now let's look at the different steps that are performed by the query optimizer. So the first step is parsing the query. So we have some SQL statement referring some columns, referring some tables, and there is some where condition. And this can be translated by the query parser into some sort of algebraic expression. So this is something like relational algebra, just a little enriched. Again, you try not to lose any information that was available here. You try to keep all of that while parsing the query. So this may look something like that. So this is a projection outside. This is a filter condition here. And then this is a cross product over all of the input relations. This is what's happening during parsing the query. And this, of course, could also be represented as a tree. So as a tree we learned about in the undergrad lecture, relational algebra can be expressed as a tree and that is the same thing here. So basically you have here a left deep version of this query, which means you build a cross product first on the first two relations, R1 and R2, cross product, whatever the result is, cross product, third relation, and so forth, until the last relation, RK. And that gives you a big table, logically, of course, only. Then you apply all of the filters that you had initially, all the filter predicates here, and then you project. So one thing to note about that here, this does not always have to be a tree. This could also be a DAG, a directed acyclic graph, especially in situations when a table is used multiple times in the query. We had situations like that in self-joins, for example. Self-joins do that. But also nested queries do that. And then you could represent that relationship rather than doubling that input relation here in that visualization just to get um, a tree, you should then rather keep it and display it as a DAG. Okay, so that's a canonical form of a query. So here's a more concrete example. Here we have a select title from A comma B where A dot name equals Hugo and A dot ID equals B dot DZ. We translate that into this algebraic expression and then we end up with something like that. And that's translated here into the canonical form. So we end up with a tree like that. Again, here we have a cross product, then come all the filters and then there's a projection. Just logically, this is just a logical representation of that query. You should never ever execute the query like that by performing a cross product and then applying the filter. Any database that does it like that is a bad database. So of course we will do that way more efficiently. But, but how do we do that more efficiently? That's a question and let's look at that. The optimization steps that are then applied are applied on this thing here. That is what the database does. And this is done by a number of rules. Rules. So rule basically is applied to a specific tree. So in other words, let's assume we have a rule that's called 42. The input is this DAG. That's a DAG. What does it output? It's another DAG. It outputs a DAG again, which is a transformed DAG. So basically it takes this DAG, which is a tree in this example, and transforms it into another DAG. And that is the idea of rule-based rule -based, rule -based optimization. This is a heuristic optimization. This may lead to trees that are actually slower in the end than the original tree. However, you can get pretty far with that. And many database systems do that in combination with other techniques. We will get to that. But to start with, this is a very good idea because there, there exist many rules that should be applied and almost always lead to a more efficient plan in the end. So let's look at some of those rules. What could you do with a plan like that? So the first thing you should do, and that is what databases do, is you split 
up the predicate. So this is a conjunct, you can easily split it. This is an end, so you can split it into two selection predicates. So logically here, the order doesn't matter, of course. I could also swap these two selection predicates. This would lead to the same result, of course. So I break up this predicate, this more complex predicate, into smaller predicates. And this is just a preparation step for the following rules. Because now what can you do with that? Notice that this here refers to one of the input relations only, A. This refers to both. A and B. So in order to evaluate this one, you have to have the information from both sides. In order to evaluate this one, you only need the information from one side, namely A. So this means we can push down this selection condition down the tree. And that is done with the next rule. This is called the push down selection rule. So this is the initial situation. And what we do is we transform this tree into an alternative tree. So here you see this selection is directly applied on A and then it goes into the cross product. Logically, of course, both expressions compute exactly the same result. That's, of course, a thing you should always be aware of. Whatever rule you introduce, make sure that they don't change such a DAG in a way that the resulting DAG produces a different result. That would mess up the correctness of your database system. But here, this produces the same result. The idea is simply that tuples that are not required anyhow are filtered out early on. So we're pushing down this selection down this tree as far as possible just to this position. Here we can already evaluate that. And the overall effect, of course, is that we have fewer tuples that are input into the cross product. Therefore, the overall number of comparisons goes down. Of course, we don't change the complexity of this operation, which is a square complexity. However, the size of the left input of the cross product is reduced. And therefore, we have fewer comparisons here. Again, notice for this, we can't do this. this is, it's not possible to push down this selection because this requires information from both sides. So we can't push it down to this side, then we wouldn't get the information from B. And we also can't push this one down this side because then we would be missing the information from A. So pushing down selections, very important. So the next thing that, that happens is when you have these cross products here, of course, they have a square complexity, which is not so great. Well, sometimes actually you keep those cross products because for small inputs, it doesn't make a big difference, but as the inputs grow larger, you have to do something about that. And that is typically when you start replacing those cross products by a join operation. And that is what happens here. So I basically combine those two expressions here into one expression. So what the rule does is it takes this one here and rewrites it to an actual join expression. So here we have a join with this join predicate and that computes the same thing as this expression. And of course, this join will in many cases be way faster than the cross product. Joins have a complexity that is n log n or even or n, depending on how you implement that. Another rule that may be applied then on this tree is you push down the projection. So we, here we have this final projection on title. But the question is, why do we keep other attributes in the tree? So we assume here that title is actually an attribute that is present in relation A, so it's part of the schema of A. Why do we keep other attributes up to this point? So assume A has, say, 10 attributes, and A has 10 attributes, and B has 10 attributes as well. So we have 10 attributes that are passed here up the tree from A, there are now, there's another 10 attributes that are passed up from B. So that's a lot of data depending on the width of those tuples. And you can avoid that because you have to move that data around. So it would be a nice idea to project out, to leave away those attributes that are not required. So it's the same effect as pushing down selections in a way. It's just rotated by 90 degrees, so to say. If you look at the table, 
what you do is when pushing down selections is you select certain rows. You say you only take this one and you only take that one. That is a push down selection. Push down selection. <clears throat> so when you push down when you push down projection, what do you do is and that is what I mean by rotating it by 90 degrees is to say, okay, I'm only interested in this one and maybe I'm only interested in that one here. So you leave away some information with respect to some of the attributes here. You leave away some information with respect to some of the tuples here. And this has also implications depending on which data layout you're using. If you do something like that here, this is way easier to do in a column store. So well, you remember our discussion on column stores when talking about data layouts. This is easier to do there. This is easier to do in row stores. Okay. Okay, so let's go back to the overall idea. Push down the projection. Let's try to push that down. Well, if you just pushed it down, we would have a problem here. It's not a matter of just putting this to a different position because now we have to be careful as here we require attribute ID from A. This is required here in order to be able to evaluate the join condition. So if you just pushed it down here, this join wouldn't work anymore. So we have to extend the list of attributes here by this join attribute here and then it's just fine. So basically what we do is we add another projection here. We keep the projection on top, but we add another one here and say, okay, from this point in time on, when pushing it up, we only need those two attributes. Everything else that is present in A is not required at all. And that is what this projection says. Of course, you could also do that on this side here. So what do you need from B? Actually, you only need the DZ. You could also directly apply projection here, logically. So there are a number of those, of those rules that can be applied. And this is just the three more, most important ones I already explained with the example above. So you will try to push down selections and projections as much as possible. That's the first rule. The second is you combine selections and cross products into joins as cross products have a square complexity and that is not acceptable for big input sets. So you need to do something better and those are the joins we talked about when talking about query processing algorithms. And you also insert additional projections whenever possible. This is like a side effect of step one. Well, but there are more problems in query optimization. So you can get pretty far with those rules and database vendors typically do not publish all of their rules because that is a business advantage. The set of rules and the way how you apply those rules can lead to better performance and therefore you can get a better database. So you don't want to publish the precise way of how to apply the rules. However, there are more challenges and problems in query optimization that you should be aware of. And one of that is join order. If you liked this video, don't forget to hit the like button. Thank you. So if you want to see more database videos, be it in English or in German, take a look at my website datenbankenlernen.de. It has a couple of English and German videos. You can also subscribe to my YouTube channel Jens Did, or you look at our website infosys.uni-saarland.de. See you there.